Hey everyone, welcome to the third installment in our Book of Hope Conservation Case Studies series. To catch up briefly, following a review of successful Australian conservation projects coordinated by the Threatened Species Recovery Hub of the National Environmental Science Program, a whole slew of amazing conservation professionals came together to produce the book Recovering Australian Threatened Species, A Book of Hope, now available from CSRO Publishing. In this third series of case studies, we'll be exploring some of the conservation successes in freshwater species from the Book of Hope, along with chapter authors. For more on the subject, you can check out our mammal case studies in episode 26 and bird case studies in episode 28, or our interview with the book's lead editor, Professor Stephen Garnett from Charles Darwin Uni in episode 22. You can also check out the book now from CSRO Publishing and all good retailers. Uh, we recommend a slice of cheesecake and a fish eye cocktail with this aquatic podcast. That's uh, pink grapefruit juice, light rum, and sour mix garnish with lime on ice. Uh, so, cheers, everybody. Mm, and enjoy. We're talking to Tansy, Dr. Tansy Smith. Uh, we're talking about Mary River catchment recovery, uh, particularly five very important species. Uh, Dr. Tansy Smith started with a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Environmental Engineering from the University of Queensland. She then completed a PhD in 2011 at the University of Technology in Sydney and also a Doctorate of Sustainable Futures. Uh, her work includes environmental management and sustainable uh, sustainable decision-making research and also social aspects, including uh, community development programs. She's also worked in research, consulting and volunteering for uh, Oxfam Community Aid Abroad in Melbourne and she's currently director of the Burnett Mary Regional Group, a special projects officer for the Mary River Threatened Species Recovery Plan and a postdoc at the University of the Sunshine Coast and, and an associate at the Institute for Sustainable Futures, uh, obviously working on threatened species recovery in the Mary River catchment. Uh, Dr. Tansy Smith, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Annie. My pleasure. No worries. So, uh, look, let's start a little bit with uh, the Mary River. Um, so, obviously, a major river system in southeast Queensland here and uh, the Wide Bay Burnett region um, of Queensland, starting in the sunny coast hinterlands and through to the Great Sandy Passage of Southern Harbour Bay in Fraser Island. I actually grew up, uh, well, I did high school in, in, in Noosa, so I, I spent a little time running around up uh, in that beautiful uh, Sunshine Coast hinterland area back there. Um, it's beautiful there where the, um, the Mary River comes through, uh, through the Gympie region there. It's actually, um, yeah, very, very uh, lovely area. Yeah, it's a pretty nice place to live and we're lucky to have um, a lot of really special species that live in the river here. Um, and, yeah, if you extend it out to the Great Sandy Strait with all the migratory birds and the um, dolphins and whales and so on, and, yeah, it's a pretty amazing part of the world. Yeah, massively uh, unique ecosystem. Uh, whereabouts are you based? Uh, our office is based in Gympie, so it's sort of in the middle of the catchment, you know, which runs um, from about Mullaney up to Harvey Bay, as you were saying. Um, but we work across the whole catchment. It's about an area of around about 10,000 square kilometres. Right, right. And obviously uh, well-known species in the area are the, uh, uh, the Mary River turtle, the Mary River cod, uh, the giant barred frog, uh, the Australian lungfish, and the freshwater mullet, all very um, uh, important and uh, sort of iconic threatened species for the Mary River. Is that right? Yeah, certainly. And um, the Mary River cod is actually the logo of the Mary River Catchment Coordinating Committee. So the cod especially has been uh, a very important part of our work over the last 20 or more years that we've been working with landholders in the catchment to try and improve the health of the river. Very cool. All right. Well, look, uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the uh, issues that um, species in the Mary River have been facing? Obviously, it's been um, uh, a long history of habitat fragmentation and, and river modification and uh, a lot of different species level threats as well, like over harvesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, of course, um, being where we're situated in southeast Queensland, there's been a a lot of um, change in the catchment since European settlement, which was around like 1840s, 50s, around that time in this area. And so, of course, people, um, the settlers were coming in with their stock and, um, you know, clearing land and and that progressed over time. Um, there's a lot of amazing <laughs> stories actually about the, the changes that were brought in the catchment in that time and... But, of course, it accelerated a lot in the last hundred or so years when we had got better and better machinery. Um, so larger areas were cleared. Um, but 
the the skimpy sort of area into the south is quite famous for um, red cedar logging that happened a lot. And people used to send logs down the river um, out to be picked up by ships that were taken wow. um, all around the world, I believe. Um, and then, of course, a bit further down the track, um, or, or a bit further back, I should say, we had the gold rush here in Gympie. So at that time, um, not only were people digging up the gold, but they were also having to fuel you know, the new settlements that were created and uh, lots of trees were logged then. And obviously, yeah, a, lo- a lot of uh, a lot of water irrigation for, for for you know some of that gold mining and for all those logging activities as well. Yeah, yeah, and there's stories back then of um, like my, uh, sorry farmers down near Tyro, which is about say 80, 100 kilometres downstream of Gympie, that um, were saying that their cattle were getting poisoned by the water that was coming from the mines in Gympie. Oof. And there's really incredible photos of the main stretch of the river through Gympie with not a tree on it and the, the tailings from the mine being put into the river. So, like, you'd hardly believe that if you went there today. Like, it looks very different. It looks... Um, a lot healthier, <laughs> but it, it isn't that long ago, really, when you think about it. So. Yeah, right. But obviously, quite a lot of uh, you know challenges in in uh, recovery planning for rivers. Uh, sort of these uh, a lot a lot more dynamic and complex connections than you have on, on some terrestrial systems, where you've got you know rivers and fr- flood pr- plains. And uh, from my understanding, the the Mary River, you know, it starts out freshwater, and you know, as it gets out into the Great Sandy Passage, you pretty much go through all the way through marshland to estuarine. To, so you've got like up and downstream freshwater, saltwater communities. So there's a lot there to, to manage. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you're always like those historical impacts that might have happened 50 to 100 years ago. Um, another one was sand and gravel extraction. Like people um, used to, you know, get into the river itself and dig right holes to, to extract sand and gravel. And all of those things add up to really changing the way the river behaves, especially during during floods and how it's affected by floods, like the amount of damage that's caused because a lot of the natural um, you know, buffers that are built into rivers that are just part of the way rivers function were taken away you know, with all the clearing and the um, changes to the riverbed that were brought about by the sand and gravel extraction. So... Like even though those things may not be happening anymore, we're still having to think about that in how we invest things to try and help the river recover and to try and make sure we get the best outcome. Right. Do 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 we have like good ideas to the extent of the uh, gravel and sand extraction from the river system? Because that's uh... yeah, yeah. I know it was quantified back then. Um, I'm not quite sure what the, the figures were, but I know there are certain sections of the river. Um, that have changed really dramatically because of because of that, and um, especially places like when you it's, you could think of it like a destabilizing force, which sort of still is felt today. That means that you end up with lots of sand in the riverbed where you wouldn't have had it. Some deep holes, which are really important for all those species that you just mentioned, um, get filled in with sand and. Um, it's just sort of, and the river is trying to clean itself out in a sense, but it's a really long process, and so we try and do things to help it on on its way <laughs> to become healthier again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, look, obviously, a lot of um, a lot of work involved in that kind of process. Um, what, what what are some of the actions that you guys have been uh, taking to try to help the Mary River? I, I understand that the um, Mary River Cod. Now that's uh, Maculocella yeah. mariensis. That's right. Um, for the recovery actions for them started as early as sort of 1994. Yeah, there was a huge amount. Like that's around the time that MRCCC, like Mary River Catchment Coordinating Committee, started. And there was a lot of interest at that time in the plight of the cod. I think people started to realise that its numbers were way, way lower than they used to be. You know, there's old stories of people um, who were still around then, like, talking about when they were kids, being able to catch them all the time and people eating them, you know, for dinner and (laughs) everything and just going down the creek and catching one for dinner. Um, And, like, that doesn't... They're still around, and, of course, it's illegal to do that now because they're an endangered species, but there are a lot less 
of them than there used to be. And yeah, around that time, there's a huge amount of community interest generated in it. And it's, I think, perhaps because it's a really impressive predator, like it's an aggressive kind of fish and it has this sort of mythology around it that um, people um, were really sad to, to know that it was disappearing from the places where it used to be and it was sort of on the back of that that the, the Mary River Cod Recovery Plan was done around that time in 1996 and uh, and why the Cod's our logo at the MRCCC. <laughs> right, right. Well, look, they they are a big um, sort of impressive and like I mean, very uh, spectacular fish. I mean, it's, it's not like a big leaping up out of the water type of thing, but they are you know pretty much big, powerful ambush predators. Uh, you know, beautiful sort of mottled camouflagey pattern, and um, yeah, just uh, monstrously sized mouths on them as well. Yeah, and they love to spend. Um most of their time, like studies have shown, like 90% of their time within one metre of a submerged tree. So, you know, the trees that fall into the river um, are really important for helping create their habitat. And, yeah, they're pretty... Like, we have a little one in the tank here that was one of the hatchlings that was bred at the hatchery, and she's... It's really amazing to see um, them in action, even when they're, you know, only 10, 12 centimetres long. I can't imagine what it would be like to come across one that's like 1.2 metres or 1.4 metres long like they people used to catch them. Right, right. Well, um, so obviously the um, Mary River cod is a super, super um, uh, iconic species for the Mary River. Um, when did you guys start moving to a, a sort of a multi-species river systems approach? Well, that in a sense came... Um, in a way, it's sort of been what we've always done in a sense because being an integrated catchment management organisation. So, you know, you're always looking at how different aspects of the catchment interact and the, the COD um, provided a way, like a talking point and a way to focus effort right, right. on things that benefit like the whole river really because the, the big thing with the COD is that they need cool water and they need these deep holes and they they need that timber in the river so of course if you have a river where all the trees have been cleared and the, you know the logs have been taken out of the water course then that's not going to be a good place for cod but if you do um, like maintain the vegetation on the banks or do some restoration projects to help it come back like that'll help the cod but of course it helps a lot of other things in the river and things on the land as well and um, improves water quality, so it has a lot of benefits. Um, so in a sense, that's sort of been a bit of the approach all along, but um, it was when the Mary River turtle was really identified, like realised it, it was a separate species, um, that people started thinking about. Right, which was only recently, right? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't that long ago at all. It was... Just trying to think when it was now. It's escaping me the date, but I think it, it was around. Was it the late two thousands or? I think it was. A, I, mean, I think it was around that same time, nineteen ninety four. Yeah. Sorry, Yanni, I can't. This just that number's escaping me at the moment. Yeah, it's um. We actually have six different species of turtle in the river, and two of them are endangered. But I think people just didn't realise that. Yeah, that Mary River turtle, nor the other one that's endangered, the white-throated snapping turtle, was um, were there until uh, uh, people used to catch them or actually harvest their eggs from the nest banks and hatch the baby turtles out and sell them into the pet shop trade. Oh, wow. So it was known as a pet shop turtle, and it was actually a, um, a quite a famous turtle expert, John Cann, who saw one of these pet shop turtles and thought, what is that? I don't know what species that is. And then he went on this, what turned out to be a couple of decades search to try and work out where it came from. And then they realized it was a new species that no one had um, described before. So, yeah. And they only occur in the Mary River nowhere else. So, pretty special. Wow. Yeah, amazing. And 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 obviously these uh, these other local species that are, that occur in the area, the giant barred frog, uh, Mixophis iteratus, um, uh, the um, the Australian lungfish uh, near Ceratodus uh, fosteri, 
uh, and the freshwater mullet Trachy Stoma Tardy. And of course, the Mary River turtle, Elisa macrurus. Um, you're right, by the way. I did check that up. It's nice. It is. <laughs> it was described as a, as a, yes, it is. <laughs> um, so obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, quite a bit of uh, community engagement for these species. What, uh, what were some of the um, actions that you guys uh, have been taking to uh, help restore the habitat? Uh, well, a lot of it focuses on um, that restoration of riverbanks, so helping people to. Um, manage their stock access, like if their stock are taking water out of the river, so we might um, help them to put in a fence, maybe some off-stream watering so that cattle can get, usually cattle around here, can get uh, water from troughs instead of having to go to the river. Um, and that brings a lot of other benefits too, like sometimes they don't have to walk as far, they might be the safer because they don't you know, risk falling down any steep slopes by the river. Um, and then there's weeds are a big issue as well. We do a lot of weed control sort of work, both um, with biological controls and physical and chemical weed control. And we work with the other um, land care groups in the area that breed the biocontrols for the weeds, um, particularly cat's claw and Madeira vine. And then we also will do revegetation projects. Um, and that all relies on private landholders, um, you know, b- wanting to be involved and being willing to be part of it. And we're really lucky in this catchment that we have a really um, large number of landholders who want to do those kind of projects. And it makes our jobs pretty easy, really. <laughs> Yeah, right. it does help when you have a supportive community willing to kind of get behind these um, conservation projects. So. Yeah, and I think the, that history of using some of these really special species to help people think about what's important about, you know, what's in the river or their creek next door, it sort of helps people stop and think for a moment and it can become sort of the vehicle for we're talking about these restoration projects like if somebody wants to do something to help improve the situation of one of these threatened species then we end up talking about um, riverbanks ultimately all the time so so that you can so many benefits from doing that kind of work yeah right obviously you know um you know, repairing the habitat and and the the threatening processes is 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 the best way to go. But you you did also mention that you guys have that one um, cod there in in the uh, uh, the centre. Um, so there there is a restocking program for the Mary River cod. Yeah, there's a, a hatchery that's um, been running for a few decades now, and particularly in the last um, ten to twenty years, it's had a conservation stocking focus. Um, and it's based in Kuroi, which is in the catchment. And um, the stocking program is uh, overseen by uh, scientists from the fisheries department. And a lot of some genetic work has been done recently to make sure that the you know the brood stock are selected to get the right sort of genetic diversity. And and then when the fingerlings are released, like we only release them in sections of the river where where the cod were thought to have been in the past, but are no longer there anymore. Right, right. So somewhere that they and should... And it's just small numbers, big pun. So somewhere they, that they should have been supported in the past and hopefully will be again, basically. Yeah, and and because the cod is, like you were saying, a really aggressive predator, if we did happen to release fingerlings where there was an adult cod, they'd probably get eaten by the cod <laughs> anyway. So. Yeah, right. But um, we're not trying to... Um, we'd ideally um, like to have the numbers build up just naturally through from the wild population but the the stocking program just helps speed that along a little we're hoping Um, yeah cool so look you guys obviously do a lot of monitoring there as well um how's the situation for these uh these uh threatened species looking now um what some couple of decades on um after starting the recovery actions well, it's a little bit difficult to say, actually, Yanni. Like, we do do monitoring of some of the features of the habitat, like water quality and, and of course, you know, vegetation extent and that kind of thing. But it's actually proved rather difficult to get um, funding off of universities that we work with to get funding to try to work out really where the populations are at, Um and the Mary River Turtle, there's just been a master's completed by 
Marilyn, who's my um, co-author of the chapter in the book, that, um, the Book of Hope. Um, she okay. just finished her master's and she did a population study of the Mary River Turtle, like looking at um, how the population's going and she's found some really interesting things like that there aren't very many young turtles and there's also a lot less female turtles than there are male turtles. So uh, it's looking a little bit worrying for them because, of course, the juveniles are the future of the population and if there aren't many females, then we're not quite sure what's going to happen. <laughs> with those. Yeah, so there's a lot of questions to be answered. Yep. Right, right. Mm. So a few challenges uh, yet to go for the Mary River, I suppose. But uh, I mean, uh, you guys are obviously having some uh, some successful projects on ground. Um, yeah. You know, for in terms of recovering the habitat, at least. Yeah, we've been really lucky to get um, like over the last twenty years various grants um, from state or federal government um, to do that kind of work and. Yeah, we just finished a big um, six-year project that was funded by the Australian government through the Clean Energy Futures Package. So we were able to work with about a well, couple of hundred landholders and um, do a lot of projects that were directly aimed at trying to improve um, the situation for these threatened species. So that was that was a great project to be able to do, and we continue to try and do that work as much as we can as well. Yeah, cool. Well, sorry, I, we, I could honestly talk about these species all day, particularly getting more into um, the uh, uh, all of these five species, the uh, the Mary River cod, the Mary River turtle, the giant barred frog, the Australian lungfish, and the freshwater mullet. But we do have to wrap this up, unfortunately. Um, just quickly before we go, um, how, how I guess just uh, uh, quickly, how is the future looking for the Mary River in your eyes? I think it's it's pretty positive because we do have this amazing community here that's really, you know, committed to trying to look after the river and, you know, it's people from all different walks of life and and we have a growing sort of number of people doing that. We often have people come into the office who we've never met before, like asking about what they can do. Um, so I think that's the really that's really the secret um, for having a positive future for the river if the people who live here understand more about what's so um, special about her and how we can improve um, the situation and yeah I think um, it's pretty positive really as long as we can k- kind of keep <laughs> taking step by step in that direction um, hopefully we'll see these these species recover in the future. Yeah, cool. Well, look, it's great that you have these uh, really cool iconic species and um, that community engagement and partic- uh, participation is like uh, is is really, really, it's always great to see, particularly, you know, if you're living in the Mary River catchment and you're lucky enough to live around them, it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's great to see people getting engaged. Yeah, yeah, it's really special and I could possibly give a plug, Yanni, for Tyro Lancare, who has been doing amazing work on the Mary River Turtle and they actually have... Uh, as a fundraiser because they do nest protection work for the Mary River turtle because uh, that's one of the big threats to the turtle is predators eating their eggs. Like it could be goannas, wild dogs or foxes and things. And they have turtle um, T-shirts that they're selling as a fundraiser that were, have this amazing um, photo of a Mary River turtle with a punk um, Excellent. hairdo that's actually, it was a, it's a wild Mary River turtle that a and week a photographer caught or he didn't catch the turtle, but he caught the photo of the turtle underwater in the Mary River, and um, it's gone all over the world. And now they've uh, made some T-shirts. So oh, I, I believe we've all seen the uh, green punk-haired uh, Mary River turtle. So yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, what was that? That, that was that was Tyro Landcare, was it? That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so guys, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tansy Smith. Uh, this has been super interesting and obviously I uh, hope to uh, that we can talk to, uh, to you about this more at some point in the future. Um, yeah, this has been super interesting. Thanks, Yanni. I look forward to that. All right, no worries. Uh, all right, everybody, that's been Dr. Tansy Smith. Plenty more wildlife cake and cocktails coming up for you shortly. Cheers, bye.
And we've got another fantastic wildlife cake and cocktails case study for the TSR Hub Book of Hope for you today. Our guest is Dr. Gerald Cookling. After studying zoology and physiology and moving on to a research assistant position at the Natural History Museum of Vienna from 1973 to 75, uh, he moved on to a PhD in 1979 at the Uni of Vienna, all in Austria. After a postdoc at the University of Göttingen in Germany, uh, Gerald moved on to tortoise and turtle conservation projects in Madagascar around 1984. Uh, he has spent many years uh, pioneering research projects with a broad range of Chelonians, that's turtles, tortoises, and terrapins, particularly uh, reproductive biology with a focus on conservation, establishing breeding and conservation program programs with a broad range of species, including in Africa, Asia, and here in Australia as well. He's a senior research scientist at the WA Department of Environment and Conservation and adjunct senior lecturer at Uni of WA's School of Animal Biology. He's joining us now to talk Western Swan tortoise conservation. That's uh, uh, pseudo emidura umbrina. And uh, we're going to get into that now. Uh, Dr. Cookling, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. I'm very happy to talk to you. Excellent, excellent. Now, um, obviously, we got to dive straight into this case study here. Um, fantastic little animal, the Western swamp tortoise or Western swamp turtle, pseudo, pseudo emidura umbrina. Is that correct? Pseudo emidura umbrina. Yes, this is correct. Right. And they're quite a small, uh, short-necked uh, freshwater tortoise. Yes, they are the, smally, uh, uh, the smallest tortoise or turtle of the family, the side-necked turtle family, Kelida in Australia. And uh, they grow to about 150 millimeter shell length. Wow, that's actually quite, yeah, that's actually quite small for Australian turtles. Um, a lot of them can get quite, quite bulky. Yes, uh, many others, all the others get bigger. Uh, so they're the smallest freshwater turtle or tortoise. Very cool. Um, now, I understand that they, uh, they're, they're fairly, they've got a fairly seasonal life, uh, life history. Yes. Right, so the seasonal winter and spring swamps uh, of, uh, of WA, I understand, you know, obviously it's fairly arid and dry, so they have to estivate over summer. Is that right? Yes, uh, this is right, yes. They are basically inactive and dormant for about half a year, can be a bit longer or shorter depending on the rainfall, really. They'll be, they'll be inactive for half the year? Yes, or more. Wow. And uh, the interesting thing is for a reptile, they also emerge and become active uh, during basically autumn and winter when it's really cold and so because it's it's a winter rainfall winter and spring rainfall area in the swan coastal plain of perth in western australia and so the activity period is really concentrated uh, to a short period in spring when it's getting warmer but uh, they do, and in particular hatchlings also, and, and juveniles, they do feed and grow all through winter, which is quite unusual for any turtle in the world. Right, right, operating at that low temperature. And obviously with that sort of uh, very uh, contracted activity period, they were probably a little bit harder to find, which is uh, why they were believed extinct until they were... Yes pretty much rediscovered by a young naturalist in, in 1953. This is correct, yes. Well, uh, they are very cryptic and not easy to find and see. And uh, although the coloration is, is not very, it, it's tinted brown or uh, up to black or beige, the, the shell color very much depends on the water and the environment where they live. So they can actually adapt the coloration of the shell to the environment. So they're really cryptic animals. And the first one was collected in, in the uh, 19th century. It was acquired by the museum, the Natural History Museum in Vienna in 1839. So, <laughs> and the next one, as you already mentioned, was found by a schoolboy in 1953. So it had disappeared for well over 100 years, and nobody really knew 
if it was still around. Yeah, right. So um, cryptic, hard to see, small populations, contracted period of activity. So, you know, basically those two were the the only uh, known, you know, I guess samples. But uh, other than that, I guess not much really being known about them. What was the uh, what was the problem for the uh, swamp tortoise, as far as conservation? Well, the problem is that the habitat. Uh, in Western Australia is uh, clay swamps, clay pens, which seasonally fill with water, like in winter and spring. And it's the most fertile soil in, in at least southwestern Australia. So it was the first area which was colonized in the 19th century. And uh, and used for agriculture, cleared for agriculture. And these seasonal swamps are very easy to drain, and then you get fertile soil where you can uh, grow crops or use as paddocks for cattle, which is now, it's, it's done a lot in this one coastal plain. And uh, so a lot of the habitat was probably lost early on during settlement of Western Australia, even in the 19th century. And then, because the area is very close to Perth, the capital city of Western Australia, uh, the, 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 the clay of the clay soils is also very valuable for the brick production, brick and tile. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of clay mining also going on directly in in the best western swamp tortoise habitat, and so the main problem is really habitat loss, uh, and this started very early on, and unfortunately it's still continuing, and uh, so the the main action to do something was really. Uh, early on, when the species was rediscovered to create two uh, nature reserves of two small habitat areas where the species could still be found in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And this is the reason why it's still around. Uh, so it was even very close to extinction uh, well, over half a century ago. Yeah. Okay. So w- there's only, uh, I guess, those uh, those two small populations. Uh, are, are they still the only populations currently uh, in the wild? Well, they are the only wild populations which still persist, if you want. But at the same time, uh, the recovery program uh, introduced the species to. Uh, several, two other sites, and uh, we do trials on on one or two further sites currently. So we basically uh, use assisted colonization to create uh, new populations, new wild populations, and this is based on captive bred individuals. So there's a captive breeding program and Perth do. The captive colony was actually first created in 1959. So very early on, it was recognized that <clears throat> this species was in trouble. And uh, so the, the first captive colony of, I think, 25 individuals was created in 1959. And Perth Zoo took it over in 1964. So if you want, it's a very long-running conservation program for the species. Yeah, that's incredible. That's, um, you know, to uh, I guess they've obviously had uh, quite a good amount of success with uh, their reintroductions and with that um, assisted colonization. Um, now, I, I imagine as well, on top of the... Um, uh, purchasing the reserves and the uh, the breeding program, there's, uh, I imagine there was a significant amount of uh, habitat management as well to try to, I guess, ameliorate some of the pressures on those wetlands? Yes, this is correct. The problem was then 
in, in the 1960s, uh, the, the wild populations, at least uh, two reserves, uh, were over 200 individuals. So still small, but uh, not tiny. But during the 1970s and 1980s, the at least one population crashed nearly completely. And uh, so in the late 1980s, there were, uh, pro the, we now know that there were, the white population was down to about 13 individuals. And the captive population at that time was down to 17 individuals because uh, the captive breeding didn't work well. So the captive group in the 1980s also didn't thrive. And in the late 1980s then, uh, this coincided when I came to Western Australia, we started basically a recovery first rescue program, which mainly concentrated on captive breeding. And since the uh, 1990s, a recovery program for the species, which was one. So it's also, yeah, it's also probably the longest running uh, recovery team in Australia, which operates for the Western Swamp Tortoises, because the Western Swamp Tortoise recovery team was uh, founded and created in 1990. Wow. So look, these are uh, the, the actions of the uh, recovery team, and obviously yourself getting involved with the reproductive biology in 1984. Um, that's a you know that's a, a lot of effort to go into I guess stopping the decline of this animal. Uh, what's the situation for the Western Swamp Tortoise at the moment? Well, at the moment, uh, the, uh, the catfish breeding works very well, and so we we know we learned quite a bit about habitat restoration, and uh, so in the wild. At the moment, there are certainly uh, many more animals than there were in the late 1980s, and even more than there were probably in the 1960s. Uh, it's, what we also learned is that the support of the community is very important, and interestingly enough, uh, the species seems to capture the imagination of people. So we get very good support uh, for the Western Swamp Tortoise and Western Swamp Tortoise Conservation uh, from community groups and uh, NGOs. Uh, and this really enables us to keep uh, the recovery actions going and running. So this is a very important aspect. Uh, so the situation overall, then a big problem now, or which it is probably a problem for several decades, but which we recognize more and more is climate change. Because in the southwest of Western Australia, basically the climate becomes drier and drier. And if you live in uh, seasonal swamps and ephemeral water bodies, which depend on the rainfall, like these clay pans, then yes, uh, less rain means a much shorter activity period. And then you may not, and the tortoises uh, are not easily able to successfully reproduce or uh, the hatchlings cannot survive if it's too dry, the uh, winter and spring is too dry. So this is a major problem we are tackling now. Uh, the University of Western Australia is quite heavily involved with research into uh, this climate change aspect and also the assisted colonization, uh, which we now do further south, more than the two or 300 kilometers to the south of the currently known populations. So this is now a major challenge still in the long term. Wow. Yeah, no, that does that that does sound like a massive challenge. Obviously for something that lives in those um uh you know almost already on the borderline um you know swamp ecosystems, then like 
the drying and, and heating of those swamp habitats is definitely going to be a major challenge. So even, even so, the conservation program uh, overall goes very well. There are still major challenges, yes. And climate, climate change is obviously one of uh, yeah, the big challenges for currently and in the future. And what, what I didn't, what I forgot, forgot to tell at the beginning is the Western swamp tortoise individuals are very long lived. So they have about the same lifespan as humans, but they also take about the same time as humans to reach maturity. It can be a bit earlier, between 8 and 15 years, generally, uh, females reach maturity. And so the whole life cycle is, uh, takes, takes a long time, it's a very long list. And so also population growth in nature, in the wild populations, is very slow. So once the populations are reduced, it takes a very long time. Uh, to get them growing again on their own, and, and, and I guess with that with that slow generation rate, there's also a bit slower adaptive potential in the populations as well. Yes, from uh, from the popula- from the generation to an over and the genetic point. Yes, uh, so it's it's in many respects a very interesting organism <laughs> and very challenging <laughs> and. For this reason, captive breeding and the captive breeding program at Perth Zoo and Adelaide Zoo is also breeding them. So there are two zoos involved. Uh, is is really important for the whole recovery program because uh, the natural population growth takes a very long time. Right. Right, right. Well, look, I mean, despite all the challenges and the ongoing issue of climate, um, it is good to hear that uh, uh, the captive populations and some of the wild populations obviously are, are, um, are you know, at least larger than they used to be. And uh, I, I, Yes, I, no, we, we, we are able, we, we basically, recruitment of natural recruitment takes place in all the populations which we created so far. That's fantastic. Which is four. And or three we created, and one one is still the uh, only self-sustaining wild population which persisted all all through uh, the, the last century. And we uh, do not interfere; we do not release any captive bred animals there. Uh, so there's only one wild population which basically is still uh, persisting and hanging on without uh, without translocation. Right, so that one's just doing its own thing. Well, it's, it's good to know that at least one of them doesn't need too much extra management effort, I suppose. Well, it, it still mm. needs a lot of, of habitat management and reserve management, in particular regarding the dry, drying climate we have. And, and the, other, the other problem... A uh, certain problem is also introduced predators, mainly the fox, the European fox. As with many Australian, mainly small mammals, it's also a problem for the swamp tortoises because the foxes uh, kill tortoises and they also uh, dig out and the nests and eat the eggs. Right, right. Well, look, uh, it's good to know that at least some of the populations and the the captive population are doing well. Um, And uh, we do have to wrap this up, but just before we do, uh, I guess, uh, what are some of the reasons for the success that you guys are having and what's the future of the species look like? I mean, obviously, uh, having that, you know, community support for such a kind of engaging species and uh, that really long-running recovery team is very important, I suppose. Yes, no, I have to say... uh for for myself, it was very surprising how much support a species which uh, a lot of people will never see or only see in the zoo in a small exhibit or so. Uh, actually, how much support such a species can get. So it's not only 
the cuddly and furry animals, but even a small swamp tortoise, a reptile, uh, obviously can capture the imagination of the people and the uh, really are concerned the public in Western Australia and Australia uh, is, and this support of the public is really the main reason for hope that the species will persist into the future because of the massive problems they have in their basically natural range. Yeah, right. Well, look, obviously a lot of challenges for them still in the future, but um, uh, how, how, do you, how do you reckon the next uh, five, ten years is looking for the Western Swamp Tortoise? I think the next five or ten years we will continue with translocations and build up populations and manage the existing ones so they will further increase in the wild and we will try to create a uh, one or two new populations outside the uh, small coastal plains and on range of the species on the south coast where the climate change predictions, according to those predictions, we can expect a suitable climate and rainfall uh, even in 50 or 70 or 100 years, which is not so sure for this one coastal plain. And since the species the individuals are very long lived, even if we release individuals now in an area which is probably not optimal right now, but will be optimal in 30 or 50 years and provide good habitat, then yes, they still will have a chance. And this is what we are working for. No worries. Well, look, I mean, there's uh, obviously a lot of challenges still there, but with people such as yourself and the recovery team on it, um, you know, fingers crossed. And uh, yeah, we hope to see great things for the Western Swamp Tortoise in the future. Um, we pretty much have to wrap it up here. Uh, Dr. Gerald Cushling, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been super interesting. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk with you. And uh, yes, I'm very happy to talk again if you feel the need. Absolutely. Anytime. Look, hopefully we can do this uh, face-to-face at some point. All right, guys, uh, that's it for now. That's uh, Dr. Gerald Cookling. Um, plenty more wildlife cake and cocktails case studies coming up for you soon. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Our um, fantastic guest today is Mr. Jared Lyon, fish ecologist and principal scientist at the Arthur Rylan Institute of Environmental Research at the Department of Environment, Water, Land and Planning in Victoria. After a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Management and Ecology uh, from the La Trobe Uni, Jared has spent many years as a freshwater fish ecologist and has extensive experience uh, in monitoring the restoration of woody habitat in rivers and streams, developing uh, ecological management plans threatened species management, and much, much more. Uh, We're going to be talking about the Australian trout cod and its recovery in the uh, Victoria uh, freshwater areas. Um, Jared, thank you so much for joining us today. This is uh, very, very excited to have you on. This is a fascinating subject. Thanks, Yanni. Yeah, it's good to to be able to come on and have a chat about it. No worries, mate. No worries. So um, let's get straight into it. Um, The Australian trout cod, so that's Maculocella macquariensis. Is that right? That's the one, yep. Makula Keller. All right, wonderful. Now, um, I understand that they're quite a long-lived fish, up to over 20 years, and fairly large, up to sort of uh, 16 kilograms. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they, um, they're, they're historical reports of bigger ones than that, and um, but now, you know, we're not sure if they were sort of those historical ones were, were Murray cod or trout cod, so, but generally nowadays, I guess the bottom line is, yeah, yeah up to about 16 kilos, you know, it's a, a, a pretty big fish to, uh, nowadays. Yeah, well, and, and still quite an impressive fish. I mean, 16 kilos is not small. Um, and these things, you know, obviously very similar, uh, I guess, to the to the Murray cod in, in look, but being a little bit more elongate and slender, but still that sort of greeny mottled pattern. 
That's right. I mean, um, they were only officially uh, separated taxonomically, I think, in about 1970 or 72 or something like that. Um, fish, fisheries biologists and commercial fishermen and a lot of people living along their rivers, I guess, kind of knew a long time ago, back to the 1850s, that they were a different species, um, but only officially um, described yeah, in the in the 1970s, so reasonably recently in the scheme of things. So yeah, they do look quite morphologically similar. Right. Okay. And uh, so obviously fairly well known um, back in the day, and uh, once pretty common in a lot of uh, habitats in the Southern Murray Darling Basin of Victoria. Um, I understand, especially around sort of large woody in-stream habitats. Yeah, that's right. Um, generally occurring in the same sort of habitat types as um, Murray cod. So, you know, they're historically from sort of upland streams down to, uh, well, Murray cod sort of go all the way down the river, um, the Murray River and, it, and its tributaries. Trout cod probably historically um, didn't push much further down the Murray and it, than sort of um, uh, probably Swan Hill. You know, you got the odd one further down than that, but then you know all the tributaries upstream, um, upstream of there. So, and yeah, they used to be really historically abundant, and uh, even though they occupy the same sort of areas, um, probably the major difference is um, is Murray cod generally occupy areas close to the bank where the flow is a bit slower. And you can find trout cod, um, you know, away from the banks, but in the middle of the river in, in, in flow that, you know, might be a bit, um, that's sort of what um, separates them, separates their habitat is, a, is that um, bit of water flow pushing over it. Right, okay. So uh, just like their namesake actual trout, you know, they, they can actually handle a bit of uh, stream action and... Uh a bit more active water. Yeah, that's right. Although trout, you know, a lot of people uh, are not too keen on that. No, they're also known as um, as blue nose cod. Um, oh, right. But um, yeah, it's trout cod, I guess, at this stage is is still the official name. All oh, right. Well, we'll we'll change that eventually. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I I understand they're now um, uh, classified as endangered under underneath the uh, Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1999 and the IUNC Red List. Um, what exactly was the the problem for these guys? I understand, obviously, there's, um, for a lot of freshwater fish species here in Australia, there's issues with the European carp and the introduced redfin perch. But there was a few other issues for, for these guys as well, correct? Yeah, I think, look, it's a, much the same as the issues with the terrestrial environment. I think, you know, starting from when Europeans uh, turned up, um, we started changing things and... Um, you know, land clearing um, clears the actual habitat of terrestrial animals. Um, when it rains, all that sedimentation and silt end up in the water, so that's no good. There's also mining and huge inputs of sediment and change morphology of a lot of our streams, you know, 150 years ago. Um, you know, carp and uh, redfin are probably more recent issues. Um, but, you know, there was a, a lot of stuff that happened before them. There was a, you know, carp and redfin, you know, probably the straw that sort of really broke the camel's back. Um, probably not even so much carp. Redfin were definitely one of them. But with regulation, you know, um, building large dams and weirs or t even little, even small small town weirs for, for water supply for towns, um, all that sort of, uh, you know, added up to basically meaning that trout cod by uh, the late 80s were back um, to one population, a natural population in the Murray River below Mulwala, uh, Lake Mulwala. Uh, it was um, reason not very abundant. Um, so, you know, they went from Lake Mulwala sort of down for about 50 or 60 kilometres and then um, a small population in uh, a creek called Sevens Creeks, which is uh, near Uroa, which had been translocated there about 50 or 60 years earlier. So they were in pretty dire, pretty dire, uh, pretty dire condition. Yeah, right. And they used to be pretty, pretty much uh, fairly widespread throughout those, uh, at least in those in-stream habitats of the Murray Darling. Yep, yep. Right throughout that, that sort of um, you know slopes and moving into the lowland areas and even some of the upland areas of the Murray Darling Basin. Yeah. Okay. So, so the bigger threat, especially historically, was um, I guess habitat modification and loss, and that river regulation, damming, and. Uh, I guess fragmenting their their habitat and their 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 gene flow from one area to another. 
That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, it, it was a range of things, yep, but but those are two of the biggest. You know, overfishing, they're quite easy to catch back when people sort of didn't know any better. Um, and, yeah, definitely competition with um, with things like uh, fish like redfin. Um, but, yeah, it's, um, it's not... And then all that on top of yeah, the the historical issues, yeah, sounds like a recipe for, recipe for disaster, right? <laughs> it was. Right, okay. So... Um, now, I understand that uh, you guys have been working fairly hard uh, <laughs> to bring these guys back from the brink. What, what kind of... Uh, I understand there was a pretty wide range of uh, actions that were implemented from fishing closures and translocations. Um, there's even a currently a breeding and reintroduction program uh, currently, correct? That's right, yeah. So, look, there was, there was a range of things undertaken and it started, you know, probably a long time before I started at work. I've been there about um, 19 years now and, you know, I think by the late 80s, um, people were starting to get pretty worried and there was a, a track called recovery plan drawn up and I guess that galvanised um, um, people into action um, and so, yes, there was a, that area of the Murray River where there was one uh, last population um, still still alive was um, was close to fishing for about five years, all fishing, which is really controversial back then. It's a really popular camping and fishing spot for, for other species like Murray Cod. So at that time, it was a, a really big move. Um, and that was probably um, the, the, the start of, you know, the start of their recovery. Um, as part of that, there was a breeding program started um, at um, Snobs Creek Hatchery in Victoria and over at Narandra at their fish hatchery and a reintroduction program um, that started in a few different areas but um, has been most successful in the Ovens River and the Murrumbidgee River. There's other spots, the Goulburn River, they're starting to do okay now. Um, and I think there's been a shift uh, in communities' uh, ownership of the environment in the last sort of 30 years as well and there's a lot more... Um, you know, a lot more catch and release going on and uh, probably started with with those who uh, remember him, Rex Hunt, kissing fish and, and putting them back for another day. You know, mo- you know, a lot of anglers now will catch fish and um, and release them. Um, so that's helped as well. Um, but, yeah, a range of things. Is, uh, and we, we manage our catchments and waterways in a, a lot more sustainable way now as well. It's not all just about irrigation and, and use of the water. It's about, you know, creating the right environmental conditions as well. So um, all those things have been important. All right. So not, not damming everything, obviously, uh, quite a significant factor. But um, it's very, very interesting that the, uh, the community attitude uh, to, towards them has had such a big shift. Obviously, being so widespread um, in the past, I imagine there would have probably been a lot of people who did enjoy catching and maybe even releasing these or at least enjoyed having them in their environment and knowing that they were about, um, who would have basically lost that until now. That's right. I think there's been a, um, you know, and even back in the old days when there was reasonable numbers around the, of them, um, you know, taking one to eat was okay before they were endangered. You know, there were sustainable populations. But I think what we've seen is uh, a generation of people coming through that haven't been exposed to, to this, this wonderful fish. And so there's people, you know, in two of the last 20 years, um, and still in a lot of areas, they're just not present. And as this species recovers, there's there's more and more people who are, you know, realising that trout caught a, one of our great native fish and um, realising that, you know, they used to be there and, um, you know, looking forward to going out and catching them, um, which is really great, you know, for, for the species to continue to recover, which, which we think it is. The community really needs to own it and, um, you know, support the recovery. And, um, you know, anglers uh, and people who go camping on the river or anyone who relates to the river are playing a major part in that by, um, you know, supporting recovery efforts. Right, right. So, look, that's um, that's very interesting. You know, you've got, um, uh, obviously, fishing closures are not always the most uh, appreciated thing. But, no. <laughs> um, you know, if you can get the community on the side, uh, on, 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 on the side of things uh, and understand their importance, it, it seems that this has worked fairly well for uh, this, uh, this species. What's the uh, situation for them now? Yeah, one of the, one of the major things... Well, one of the major things was probably the reintroduction programs. They're, they're um, reasonably, in the scheme of things, reasonably easy to breed in a hatchery. And, um, you know, we've done some work over the past 10 or 15 years to look at 
at um, what makes a successful reintroduction. And with this species, it was the fact that it was um, done for a long period. Instead of just doing um, restocking for two or three years, it was done over a 10-year period. And, um, you know, that was, you know, of that 10-year period, there was really only a couple of years uh, in, um, that survived really well. And so if it had only been restocked for two years, you might have missed those two years that where they had good recruitment. And so that was a key, that was key to, to recovery. And that, look, these populations now are self-sustaining and spreading out. So you're down here in Victoria where, we, where I work, um, you know, it was the Ovens River we worked on and um, we're seeing fish move back into the Murray and, you know, 100 k's upstream and they're now moving into the lower Kiwa River and, um, you know, hopefully they'll continue to continue to expand in the Goulburn River, Tradcotter, uh, which they were stocked as well, um, taking a bit longer to, um, to hit their straps but uh, are coming back quite well and, you know, the Murrumbidgee is, is really a, a hot spot for them as well. So, yeah, pretty encouraging. Wow, that's pretty. Um, that's pretty uh, amazing. From what basically two sites with low abundances in the nineties. Um, it is. To, <laughs> that's a yeah. So they're pretty much breeding and starting to expand across uh, you know some parts of their historical range. Is that correct? That's right. And the more we do, the more we work on um, uh, river restoration. So um, stopping sediment getting to streams by by being you know riparian riparian restoration or building um, fishways on weirs or even removing weirs and you know working with anglers about um, catch and release and then getting anglers to support that sort of stuff um, all that sort of stuff that you know, helps those populations um, increase and um, you know if, if we've got good connected populations across the sort of mid to upper Murray Darling Basin um, you know there's no reason why you know, over the next um, next five or ten or, or more years, we, we shouldn't see a really strong and thriving population of these species. And look, at, even in the future, maybe consider, um, you know, having them available to, to anglers to catch. You know, it's the ultimate ultimate aim of, uh, you know, recovery is that they're self-sustaining and, you know, in a, in a fishery sense, you know, people uh, engage with the fish and, uh, you know, see a... Um, you know, are able to to go out and target them, and if they want to take a you know take one home eventually, then you know maybe that could be a good thing as well. And I think I, I would imagine that's it would be a good discussion to have. Maybe maybe not quite yet, but in the next five or ten years, you know, to start start talking with um, community groups about that sort of approach. Wow, that that soon, five ten years. Yeah, I think so. I think um, there's a fair bit of interest out there, and you know, you might start at something relatively small, uh, a small limited um, limited slot, uh, what, is, what they call a, a slot limit, and um, you know, these these fish are self-sustaining in some areas are you know really abundant. I mean, we're talking now in, in some areas of the Ovens River, probably the most abundant species, and um, of course, it would have to be very heavily regulated but we also know from long experience and not just in Victoria but around the world um, that um, you know it, it, the sort of um, um, use of use of these resources and, and people to be able to you know engage with these with, with, with any endangered species is a is a you know way that you know they might be able to you know take one of a, of a um, for the for the table is a really good way of sustaining populations into the future. You know, people value things that they can relate to, and um, you know, I, I reckon we're moving towards that discussion over the next year, five or ten years, but not quite yet. But you know, I'd, that's where I'd like to see us first get for for any if we can get um, get to that level. That means my job's done anyway. You know, we've done a we've done the job of of getting them. Um, you know, off the endangered list and and back and self-sustaining and people out there and amongst them. Absolutely. Well, wow. um, and obviously, anytime you can add a value to a, a threatened species to to anybody, it does help its chances of of getting funding for recovery and and getting support and that kind of stuff. So there's no doubt about it. I mean, a lot of the money nowadays for recovery comes um, comes through you know community want and need, and so you know if the community can can grab hold grab hold of a um, a species and, and champion it it's much more likely to 
to get funding into the future and that means it's much more likely to survive into the future so that you're not just relying on on governments to um, you know look after recovery you've got a movement of you know a, a movement of people out there in the environment that are, have taken that to heart and taking it to, um, a leading the charge so ultimately that's where, where we'd like to be um, yeah but a little while to go yet yeah fantastic work though. I mean um, uh, I guess to go from two sites with low abundances in the 90s to, to hoping in the next five to ten years to uh, put them back on the um, the anglers menu that's um, that's quite an incredible turnaround um, I, I guess um, uh, I, I, uh, we should pretty much wrap this up fairly shortly but just before we go what do you think are some of the reasons for um, for the success here and um, what's the future look like for the species obviously some of the uh, population modeling that you guys done uh, did to understand um, the uh, viability and recruitment rates and what you need to do to uh, have a successful reintroduction were very important um, is, there, is there any any other factors that you thought were super significant um I think uh, back in the 90s when, the, when, when this all started, um, having a group of people that worked across, you know, uh, across different state agencies um, was really important, a group of experts. So, you know, this was uh, led by people in government agencies, really, and um, with support of angling groups. Um, having those people sort of there for the long haul, and, you know, a lot of these people are still around, um, was really important. Like I said before, um, you know, the 10-year stocking, which was... Um, that was coming out um, of a population model that was developed for the, the species and basically that model said look to have the best chance of survival um, you want to, rather than you know just a couple of years stocking you want to stock them over a long time and that proved the case that that worked so you know having robust, good robust science to back your recovery um, is important and yeah the community ownership really is important I mean I think that's the same for for any threatened species, if you can get a hook, well, <laughs> for want of a better word, it's a um, pardon the pun. If you can get a, a hook that um, engages people, and you know, get the community to um, you know get behind your conservation effort, then it, it just makes the job so much easier. And um, you know, we see that every day, not just with fish, but with a, a range of species around the world. That um, you know, if you can get that community support behind them, and of course, it's harder for some species than others, but if you can, it does make the, um, the, the job of working on recovery a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, just before we go, the future for this uh, uh, lovely uh, freshwater fish uh, of the, our southern states, how's, how's things looking? Um, five, ten years, you think? Well, at the moment, they're looking, they're, they're looking really bright. I mean, like I said before, I'd, I think my job would be done as a, as a researcher and as a government conservationist uh, if we're at the, ta at the stage for, that we can maintain a, a self-sustaining fishery that's you know tightly managed but is is there you know if I could see that you know <laughs> in the next five or ten years um, that was done in a way that that isn't going to affect the um, recovery of the species but rather you know, rather is um, you know a, a way of engaging more people in the recovery um, then you know that's where, that's where I'd like to be um, you know five or ten years yeah, it's pretty ambitious but if you look at where we've come from um, from a couple of little populations to now this this fish spreading out through a, a lot of different areas. Um, you know, it's probably a well, it's a conversation that I know uh, is happening within angling groups already. I know they're quite interested in in how that might unfold. You know, and they've they've been real advocates for for recovery because they want to be able to go out and um, and target this species. So, you know, that's um, you know that's a discussion that's coming, and you know, of course we're. Open to having it, open to having it, and uh, but part of that, of, of course, would need to be, um, you know, looking at, at de downlisting, um, you know, potential downlisting of a species. You'd need to make sure that it was quite quite highly regulated, um, because we don't want to end up back where we were. But um, you know, we're also really cognizant of the fact that um, having community and, and angling groups and that sort of stuff driving this forward is the way of the future. No worries. No worries. Well, look, fingers crossed they keep on breeding and expanding across their um, their uh, old historical range and, and people all over the state and all throughout the Murray-Darling are going to hopefully have the chance to um, to see them again and, and get involved. That's right. Touchwood. I think it's, um, it's all looking pretty good at this stage.
All right, fantastic. Jared, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been absolutely fantastic, super fascinating stuff. Cheers, mate, much appreciated. Righto, thanks, Jeremy. See ya. All right, that wraps up our freshwater case studies for the Book of Hope. More case studies on the way soon. You can also check out the book now at CSR Publishing and other outlets. Just Google Recovering Australian Threatened Species, A Book of Hope. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to like and follow us at Wildlife Cave Cocktails on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and so on. Uh, more WCC action on the way shortly. Cheers, everyone.